Attention listeners, this episode contains spoiler alerts. My name is Kristen Nelson. I'm the author of Worldwide Crush. Worldwide Crush is about the joy that comes with that very first crush. It's about a seventh grade girl who's on a quest to cross paths with her first crush. Roy Calhoun is a giant superstar. He's an international megastar. Millions and millions and millions of girls and boys are in love with Rory Calhoun. Millie's just one of those people. When Rory's song Worldwide Crush starts climbing the charts, he admits to the world that the song is actually about his real life desire to meet someone and fall in love. And he believes that the person for him is actually in the audience. And what this tells everybody is that they all have a shot. <laughs> And Millie's like, why couldn't it be me? That could be me. I know I'm in seventh grade, but I don't know why couldn't it be me. And so this means that all she has to do is get to one of his concerts. And if she could do that, she could be his worldwide crush. So the question is, how far will she go to make that happen? Turns out it's kind of a lot. And it involves whales. And did you mean, when you wrote that book, did you mean to make us feel like we were one of them. In other words, you were, you were all of us. And it's like, you really did that in your writing. Oh, okay. Number one, I appreciate that so much. Number two, I don't think I did that on purpose. I think what I thought my job was, was to just do it as authentically as I knew in my own heart. And then you just cross your fingers that other people had that same feeling in their heart too, or that they at least understand yes. what you're saying, right? And so I think what um, I think what you're saying. Welcome to the Sean Squad Society podcast with your host, myself, Cindy Doris. Dame Madonna, where we invite you to share in our enthusiasm and reminisce about all things Sean Cassidy. From his teen idol days to his recent adventures back on the road again. Please join us for the stories and memories that connected us to those happy days that helped create the Sean Squad Society podcast. Kristen Nilsson is our special guest today. She has been a children's librarian, a bookseller, a perfume seller, a horse poop shoveler. <laughs> a typist, mm-hmm. truth, on an actual typewriter, to say the least, and a storyteller, a seventh grader, and a mom to both humans and dogs. But today, she is a self-proclaimed pro-crushologist who talks about Gen X and pop culture on the Pop Culture Preservation Society podcast. Thanks, you guys. Welcome, Kristen, to our podcast. I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you. Yes, and you wrote a book recently. I think this was released last year, right? I did. July this summer. So it's a little, my baby is seven months old. Baby, seven months old, yes. What's what's the name (laughs) of your baby? The name of my baby is Worldwide Crush, and it's actually a novel that's written for middle schoolers. But the funny thing that is happening, I wrote it for kids, but somehow adult women particularly women in middle Mm -hmm. age, are finding this book and they're reading it and they're enjoying it as much as the kids are. And there's a nostalgia element to that because the book is about a seventh grade girl who is on a quest to get tickets to the concert of her dreams. This concert is by her first crush. And it turns out that what moms are identifying with is number one, all the women who are trying to get tickets to Taylor Swift. Oh, right? Yes. All yeah. of them understand yes. this. But it's also sending them back in time because it's a, it's a rare person who didn't fall in love for the very first time with a celebrity. True. Whether it was somebody on TV or somebody on the radio, that those are the people yes. we tend to fall in love with first. And so they read this book and they kind of tumble back in time and they remember what a sweet time that was for them. It sure was. I related to most mm-hmm. of it. Kristen, I watched you opening your book for the very first time, the box, and you just started (laughs) crying. And I yes, and then you said, "Oh, she's so cute, (laughs) Melanie on the cover." Yeah, Melanie is so cute. I love that. The main Mm -hmm. character is on the cover, and the cover I'm so so happy with because I had a little bit of input on the cover, but only so far, and it mattered to me so much that I 
pushed a little too much and oh. called into the principal's office. And they're like, yeah, they're yeah. like, Kristen, you got to back off. This is not your call. We're going to let the professionals take care of this. But I was definitely afraid that they would put the wrong kind of oh. crush on the oh. cover because I'm writing about a girl mm-hmm. and her crush and and he's described in, in the book. And I didn't want readers to see one thing on the cover, yes. read about on the inside. They made you proud. It needed you were to- so proud. It yes. was cute. I yes, I needed I needed it to be just mm-hmm. right. And so I was getting really, really picky about the boy that they were choosing for the cover. And in the end, they knocked yeah, him. Yeah, how'd out you of the choose park. him? So I needed him, first of all, we, I didn't want people to see his face because I needed him to be somewhat anonymous. The reader is gonna bring their mm-hmm. own feelings and they're gonna make their own picture in their head. And it probably has the face of the person that they fell in love with. So I needed it to just be a kid who was very casual and cool, not flashy, not sparkly. He needs to be that kind of kid who would play an acoustic guitar and yeah, wear he's a, in a t-shirt. bracelet and his hair is kind mm-hmm. of floppy. He's wearing a white t-shirt, jeans that fit him just perfectly right. He might just be sitting at a bonfire on the beach Walking the beach. his guitar. <laughs> yes, that's right? That's wrote. who I needed this kid to be because that's the kind of kid that I was falling in love mm-hmm. with. I wasn't falling in love with the super overtly sexual shiny quaffed that was not who i was some people were falling in love with that person the boy next Mm -hmm. door that's it (laughs) i needed it to be the boy next door because when you're little when you're young you need somebody who's very safe when you're nine ten years old you're not going for the smarmy guy generally you want the boy next door because that's very safe Uh, he looks pretty safe they did it they 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 really did and Mm -hmm. last night i read a lot of the book again and i went to bed and somehow in my dream, I had a face on this kid, but it wasn't Sean's <laughs> face. I don't it know. It wasn't Sean's face. And, and I remember in my dream going, wow, you don't look anything like I expected you to, Rory. And I'm like, who is this kid? But obviously, it's some face I've seen somewhere in my life. I don't know. And it just matched your feelings and the words came together and you can't. So Rory Calhoun is the name of the crush. He's really, this entire story is culled from my own experience of falling in love with Sean Cassidy in 1977. So really this boy, this crush is Sean Cassidy. I mean, he's all of my crushes. I had had so many crushes, but I pictured Sean Cassidy the whole time. Me too, the yeah. whole time. That mm-hmm. hair, that sweet face. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, the sweet face. Oh. Mm-hmm. And in your writing, you are such a descriptive writer. You oh, make me you. feel like I'm right there. Yes. Yes. That's such a good news for me. And that's that's why you cried, that Therese. Is, that's why you cried. That's that means exactly I did a good job. Cried. We were talking earlier that I read when Millie finally got up on stage and she was never going to cry. She wasn't going to cry. She was going to do her big girl thing. And and then I'm mm-hmm. like, yeah, Millie, what's with this crying? I'm with you, girlfriend. <laughs> and I get to the part and I'm bawling like a baby. I'm bawling like a baby <laughs> when she's backstage in her little safe room that they put her in. And, she, yes. and I'm just yeah. like, Every emotion mm-hmm. that I said when I was 14, 15 years old came out and I could feel Millie feeling all of what she was telling me that she was feeling. I'm like, oh, stop, stop telling me. <laughs> <laughs> and then to top it off, her crush comes in there to console yes. her. The end is what really gets you. And that's the part that made oh. me cry. Oh, I'm so glad you guys, this is such good news for me because it means, it means that we had, that you see me, right? Because I'm really putting myself on the page and because it made you cry, that means that you understand me and how I felt and my understanding. And that's so validating. That's validating for me as a writer, but it's validating for me as a woman, as a person yes. that you understand. We all went it, through right? that. Yeah. We all went through. Yeah. But the ending is all of us. And did yeah. you mean, when you wrote that book, did you mean to make us feel like we were one of them? In other words, you were you were all of us. And it's like you really did that in your writing. Oh, okay. Number one, I appreciate that so much. Number two, I don't think I did that on purpose. I think what I thought my job was, was to just do it as authentically as I knew in my own heart. 
And then you just cross your fingers that other people had that same feeling in their heart too, or that they at least understand yes. what you're saying, right? And so I think what um, I think what you're saying is that when I dug deep into my heart to do to explain what it was I was experiencing, you all experienced yes. the yes. same thing yes. right alongside yes. me, and that's yes. why it resonates with you. In school, in my big public school, I actually liked him more than the rest of the kids, and. When I couldn't afford to buy a poster, my friends would, you know, show it to me and ha ha, look what we have. And one time they put it down on the cement there at playground and I reached down and then I kissed it. I remember kissing it. (laughs) It was just a peck. That's all I knew. But um, yeah, yeah, of course, I kissed that and I thought, you know what? I am the biggest fan there is of Sean Cassidy. And I really believe that. Or believed, I should say, past tense. Until Mm -hmm. I started actually getting to go to his shows. And then I realized, Doris, Cindy, they they are as crazy about him as I was. Or they were. Yeah. If that makes sense. And and that's almost, you would, logic would say that that would make you feel like, oh, I'm not the only one. Or he's not meant for me. Or he's not going to choose me. I'm the number one fan. But the truth is the opposite takes place. We rejoice in it because you have somebody to to share your joy with. It's like joy amplified. It's joy multiplied. And for some reason, in our our 10-year-old brains, when you get together with a person who is also crushing on your crush, it's a place where you guys see eye to eye. It's like you bond over it instead of getting jealous of each other. It's not like actual relationships. You're like, no, we're the same. We like the same thing. I see you. You see me. Let's be friends. And you know what? I heard in your, well, we're not talking about just the podcast right now. We're talking about your book, but Sean Cassidy, when he did the podcast with you, that made him emotional, what you're talking about right now. Yes. Yes. He got it, he he choked up for a moment and i and my heart just leaped into my throat to watch him get emotional over over that moment because he so recognized he so acknowledges and honors what it is that we felt yes. for him as an important part yes. of our growing up it's not about him He's like, this is not about me. This is about you. This is about you growing up and and the role that I played in it. And he takes that honor very seriously. And it made him yes. emotional. Even, even though people may not have, you know, the people who liked him at 12 years old are now in their 50s. And so, and so 45 years later, that is still making him emotional. When I was reading the book, and a lot of times I, I read a few sections that I thought, Millie. Are you sure you're only in seventh grade? Because she she <laughs> speaks so eloquently in her wisdom. Her and Shauna, when she was writing her letter, yeah. did you catch that her best friend's name is Shauna? Uh-huh. We caught it. It is on purpose. Yes. And no, and it's also her name is Shauna Mendez, which is so this is a nod to not just Sean Cassidy, but Sean Mendez. Millie writes her first right. letter because mm-hmm. her grandma tells her, why don't you write a letter? And that cracked mm-hmm. me up because she didn't even know where to put a stamp on her letter. She said, actually <laughs> write a letter. And she did. And Shauna had to explain to her, that's not even coming close to what you want to say. And I'm like, the wisdom of these little seventh graders, was mm-hmm. I that smart in seventh grade? That she was eloquently able to explain to her friend that you want him to know what you want and you want him to feel it and rewrite that letter. And she convinces her to do it. And she writes it in a way like, I'm like, that looks like a ninth or 10th grader. And then you have Rory himself and you don't get to hear him speak until almost the end of the book. It's like, are you sure this kid is not like 25? Just uh, <laughs> mature at a young age. Mature and able to yeah. console and able to talk and able to get this girl back to where she needed to be. And this is where I'm crying oh in the book. Yes. I'm like, mm-hmm. these people are oh. killing me. They're not, they're not 10 and 12 <laughs> and 15 years old. What is really happening? Those are those are such good observations. And I think part of that comes from um all of us had a savvier friend. Right. We may have felt unwieldy and uh, and 
out of our element and uncomfortable and never knowing what we're supposed to do. And that would be the main character, Millie. But a lot of us had that savvier friend who just seemed more confident and seemed to know more stuff. And that's Shauna. And so she's, Shauna's like pulling Millie into adolescence very grudgingly. Yeah. Millie's kind of holding on to her childhood. And Shauna's like, come on, let's go. Let's be teenagers. And Rory is supposed to be 15. And I kind of get his wisdom from watching the new teen idols. We don't use that word right. anymore. We probably call them celebrity crushes mm -hmm. or pop stars or whatever. They are forced to grow up very quickly. If you listen to, and I don't, and I don't say that in a bad way. I mean, the things that they're having to deal with require them to make adult decisions. And if you listen to interviews of like Taylor Swift or Olivia Rodrigo when they were young, 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 you can tell they're grappling with big topics and they're having to have adult conversations with, you know, grown up men yeah. in suits in, yeah. in yeah, boardrooms and things like that. And she was like, mm, right. I don't think so. I'm going to trust my own inner wisdom and I'm going to do it this way. And I think the people who are blowing up so big right now, the Taylor Swifts and the Olivia Rodrigo's yeah. and the Harry Styles are really forging their own path. They have to listen to their voice. And I think that voice has to be wise yes. beyond its years in order for them to yeah. have the confidence to do well, that. It I was True. I was so touched as I said, and then there was humorous. Oh, you you know, Grandma, she can't be called Grandma. <laughs> I loved the whole thing, everything about her, yeah. and she just was such a good force. And she Cheryl. was, yeah, she's... Cheryl. Mm -hmm. Cheryl needs to be called Cheryl because she thinks Grandma yes, is an yes, old yes, word. Yes, she doesn't want to be old. old but yeah, she's mm -hmm. so in tune, in tune with Millie, in tune with little Billy. She's like. I got you. Don't worry. Yeah. They were a cute family. And more so than they're it's a very much a family story. It's and that also I didn't I didn't intend to write that. I thought I was writing a story about a crush, but it really ended up being both a family story and a story about mothers yes. and daughters. Yeah. I got that too. Sort of accidental. I came out with that at the I didn't I finished the book and I was like, hey, did I just write a book about mothers and daughters? <laughs> but I did. And so mothers and daughters, including Cheryl and her daughter, who was Millie's mom. And then you have Millie's mom and Millie. And like a lot of seventh graders with their moms, they're having trouble having a meeting of the minds. And sometimes that's where Cheryl, the grandma, can come in. She can see it from a distance. She's not having to parent so hard anymore. And she can come in and be I like, I you. see you, seventh see grader. You. I understand. I've been yeah. through this a couple of times. Millie, she actually felt... Um, shame but <laughs> millie felt bad too dragging her whole family to california and there she is yeah. and she even pictures her first crush walking the beach and she thinks it might be him and yeah. so it just touches mm -hmm. her and then when she wakes up that morning she looks out and she sees her parents actually cuddling together and they're <laughs> drinking coffee and they're listening to the waves and she just loves that moment and i love how you make us feel like we want that for our family, you know, that mm -hmm. moment. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Isn't that interesting that, um, that this becomes this, that Millie's story becomes about her family and how she feels bad about things she said and done to her family. And then when she sees them happy, that makes yes. her happy. Yes. She has this very push me, pull mm -hmm. you like, you guys are driving me mm -hmm. crazy. I hate you so much. I'm so yeah. sorry. I made you do this. I love you guys. And that basically is seventh grade. True. In a nutshell, very true. Right. And I, I, I think that it came about this way to have this family story embedded in this seventh grader story is because seventh grade, one of the difficulties of being seventh grade is that you you cannot have a story just about a seventh grader. You can't have a life without the grownups right. in your life. Teachers, your parents, you need the people who have credit it's cards. It's a unit. And yeah, it's a license, unit you have to or tell. You got nothing. Everybody involved. Yes. You have no agency without a mom who gives you permission, who who pays yes. for the, the ticket, yes. who drives you yes. to the concert. Somebody else is making your decisions for you. If you if it was up to me, right, in seventh grade, I wish I could be like, I want to go see Sean Cassidy. All right, I'm buying my ticket now all by myself. I'm going to drive a car. There's no seventh grader on the planet who exists like that. Right. You're depending utterly and completely on these grownups around you. And so it seems disingenuous to write a book about a seventh grader yeah. that doesn't involve the grownups. You're right. and, when, True. and when she writes writes these letters to him, they're touching too. But the one that actually goes with that day when she thinks she sees him, 
I just adored it. It's on page 201. Can I read a portion of that? Oh, okay. please. I love it. Before I came here, I told myself that I was coming to feel you, not find you. Because really, what are the chances of running into the world's most beloved celebrity while you're walking down the street? Hmm. Even if it's his street. Well, I assume they keep you locked up <laughs> in an unmarked cars and secret tunnels and stuff like that so that you don't have to pose for pictures and sign autographs all day long. Instead, I, I only needed to see where you lived, where you breathed, where you grew up. I wanted to see that for myself. I feel like I had a truly everlasting Rory Calhoun experience, but maybe finding you and feeling you are kind of the same thing. And when I say feeling you, I mean, I literally feel like the air around me contains pieces of you or something. Oh, that <laughs> sounds so weird. I'm not a weirdo, I promise. Please believe me. <laughs> But this feeling yeah. like your heart is beating near me, it makes me look over my shoulder constantly with a combination of hope and disbelief. Kind of like, hmm, thinking, are you there? And of course, he's not there. But all at the same time, it's not a bad feeling. It's awesome. I'm happy feeling pieces of you around me. Even if I never set eyes on you, this feeling will make the trip completely worthwhile. Oh, I feel like Yay. you should have. That was good. <laughs> I love that part of it. Highlighted in your book about why do we cry about okay. them? Yeah. Why are we crying about yeah. this whole experience? And why do we mm -hmm. even need a teen idol crush? That's such a good question. Yeah. And I think I addressed it in the book by by Millie being, just like you, Doris, being disdainful of the people who would cry mm -hmm. in his presence. Like, she's just like, that's not smart, you guys. You're not <laughs> pretty when you cry. <laughs> you need to be a grown-up about mm -hmm. this and be like, hello. Yes. Yes. But then when, when push comes to shove, she dissolves into yeah. tears. Thanks. And so I wanted to speak to that because that has happened to me where I have yeah. every intention of being a grown-up mm -hmm. and then right. I am not mm -hmm. at all. And I've seen it happen over and over again. And I think that... Well, I'm trying to figure out if I tell you the story of how it happened. Okay, I'll get to Aww. that. I'll get that to that in a minute. But the reason that it happens is very simple. It's overwhelm, right? True. Like you have so many feelings and they're so big that you 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 short circuit. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is the very definition of being a tween and a teen, of being 12, 13, 14. All of this is we're having so many new experiences when we're that age and we're on the cusp of being a teenager and we're on the cusp of being sexual beings. We're not sexual beings yet, but we're on the cusp of it. And so much is new that it overwhelms mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And that's why people, everyone wants to say that the reason that they have such big feelings is because of hormones. I kind of disagree with that. Biologically, that might play a role, but I think more importantly, they're just dealing with so much for the very mm -hmm. first time and your cup just overflows. You can only yeah, hold on to so much. I don't think so you're thinking much. about them sexually either. I mean, I mm -mm. think you're just thinking about no, this, not at all. this human being that you just not adore. Yes. You know, yes. so I don't think mm -hmm. hormones, like you said, I don't know if they're all yeah. the way there yet, but just somebody that you really yeah. click with. That's one thing that has been difficult for people to understand in the book industry in particular, because a lot of I got a lot of rejection in the beginning because they said you cannot write about, quote unquote, romance for this mm. age. They said you have to make the characters older. This has to be a young adult novel, not a middle grade novel. And I said to them, they said, would you be willing to age up your characters? And I said, absolutely <laughs> not. Because when this phenomenon happens, that was we're it. not no. 15. We're mm -hmm. 10. We're doing this for the first it time. Innocent. And it is, mm -hmm. it's completely innocent. It is, and they didn't understand mm -hmm. that. They thought that this was going to end with a 12 year old making out with a 15 year old. No, that no. is not what this is about. Innocent at all. affection is what Sean described it as. Yes. Mm -hmm. Completely and utterly right. innocent. And a lot of the reviews, like once it did get published and the reviews came out, they would say things like, you know, this is a tribute to innocent fandom, mm -hmm. um, innocent teenage feelings. They Adults like to take their adult knowledge and put that over the yes. top of a child's mm -hmm. experience. And that's why you have things like you know, parents saying, you can't watch this. You can't, you can't do right. have that poster. You can't, well, you can't have the poster. You can't have that poster because they are thinking sexually. Yeah, mm. like, they don't know that we're not thinking sexually True. at not. all. There's not even, there's not even holding hands in mm. this book. There's no right. kissing. That's not what the experience no. was. It was so, really just looking at And that's yes. something I heard David Cassidy say years ago. I heard a, um, yeah. 
I don't remember where I, I was listening to something or watching something. And it wasn't after he died when they had that whole thing on uh, A&E or whatever channel. But they played an mm-hmm. audio tape of David Cassidy at a radio station doing an interview. And outside of that station, it was freezing cold. And there the girls were standing around and they were crying and everything. And the DJ asked him, why do you think they cry so hard for you? And David said, because they're little and they have all these emotions. Oh, they're little? Like they're young. Oh. They're very young people oh. with, with very yes. young emotions. And, and they have them all in their yes. body all at one time. And they don't know what to do. And it's just like you said. They explode into tears. They're young. Let me read what's in the book, though, because I did highlight that. I highlighted about the crying. And it says, she will cry because they all cry. She will cry because his words, his song will go straight into their heart. And maybe, just maybe, super slim chance, but still, just maybe he will fall in love with her. Yeah, I mean, you just you. Everybody thinks. There's yeah, a chance. everybody thinks there's a chance. Yes. Like, it might. We're just still happen. waiting. I know I'm ten and he's nineteen, <laughs> but it, yeah, there, it could still happen. No, it could still happen. but at the end of your book, you mentioned you know she know, knew at the very end that she would not have her first crush that way, and so mm-hmm. at that point she becomes like the rest of us, and she looks around to find similarities in some of these other boys. Yeah. And I was telling the girls, I would always look for boys with the longer hair, the feathered hair. Mm-hmm. And that meant a lot. It's, it's like, he. so this is like, a, it's a, uh, that Sean Cassidy experience was a learning mm-hmm. experience for you because you were starting to learn yes. what you liked. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right? Not just in what they looked like, but what their personality mm-hmm. was and stuff like that. And so we are, we're trying this out for the first time on somebody that is very safe who can never reject mm-hmm. us. And then we learn from that information and we start to grow up and we might turn away from our celebrity crush and we might turn toward people who are actually like in our classes, mm-hmm. like real in the flesh people. Mm-hmm. And now you know that you like somebody with long sandy hair. Yes. You might like somebody who's a dog lover. You might like somebody who dresses very casually in, you know, a clean white t-shirt. You learn. This is all a learning experience. That was the second one I highlighted. It says crushes on celebrities are real and they are intense and they serve a purpose. They are an important Mm -hmm. step in learning how to be in love. It allows them to see who they are in a relationship and stand back and let them love these people until they are ready for something else. So you're learning who you want to love in life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. That was a teacher. She goes to a um she goes to a, a workshop with her mom called Yumi and Yes, Kirti, which I is read also this. embarrassing and cringy. <laughs> but the teacher in the workshop is is schooling the moms, like, calm down, moms. This is a really important experience yeah. for them. That was funny too. Yeah. Millie really want to be there though. I don't think she did. No. Oh my <laughs> God. No, with her mom. Yeah. yeah. No. So embarrassing. But she loved watching her parents there. I wrote this down. The family was sipping coffee and washing the seals. And how I like the part how you said that even though Millie couldn't hear much noise, it was still as much fun as going to Disneyland. She felt like she was at the prettiest little place and it smelled like happiness. Part of that comes from, we just, um, and we'll talk about my podcast later, but we just did two very important episodes on Kramer versus Kramer, mm-hmm. which really brought up a lot of things about divorce. And I think it's imp- kids relish their parents being in yes. love. It makes mm-hmm. them feel secure that their family is intact and happy and no discord will ever come mm-hmm. to their house and make them have to go to their dad's house on the Aww. weekend and things yeah. like that. So when you see your parents happy like that, Whew, it's like a rush yeah. of security. She realized mm-hmm. her parents needed it as much as she yeah. did, you know? She may be wanting yeah. to be in the same area where she could breathe his air, but she could also yeah. see her parents in love. Yeah. And mm-hmm. she needed it. That's like a an imprint mm-hmm. for her. Like, isn't that what I want too? I don't I want to be happy and in love like that too? That's yes. that's the blueprint I'm working toward. That reminds me of a story mm-hmm. where you talk about him. She wants to be in the same air as him. And I was in yeah. middle school and I was like in Sean Cassidy. We had to go to Hawaii to see our family, but we had a layover in LA. And I said, oh my gosh, Sean lives in LA. I have to go outside and grab a rock or breathe the air or something. <laughs> so I grabbed a rock outside of the airport and I thought, I'm here where Sean is right now. And that was overwhelming to me. That, see, that's exactly what it is. Like, you just feel like he could have stood in this exactly. exact same spot. You don't it, know. Was, yeah. 
Another point, your dedication is still there. That's another point to make too. We liked him back then. Why are we still so dedicated now? So it's not even that you're you're trying to meet him or want anything from him. It's it's just being in mm-hmm. his presence as much as you can is what makes you happy. And I think that's that's important for him to know too. You're like, I don't want anything right. from you. I just want your your talent mm-hmm. and I want your presence. I want your aura. I want your heart. I want your humanity. But why do we still have this yeah. dedication? Mm-hmm. I have a very simple yeah. answer for that. I think it's because when we revisit our crush on Sean Cassidy, we are revisiting ourselves at the age in which we True. loved him. And we like those little girls. That was a happy time for us, right? We were innocent and the world was a good place and we have these happy feelings. And so at this point in time, we get to spend time with that little person that we were and that feels good. True. It's like with your book where he brought her up there and it just made her almost, I mean, she did, she fainted. Like she was just like this. She overwhelmed. Yeah, overwhelmed. You're so that totally part went paralyzed. with your book, and I was just like, oh, so yeah. cool. Mm-hmm. That book bring, brings all of us back together. Yeah, it does. It's en- And that's why it's being read by mm-hmm. so many people who are in middle age, because it's allowing them to go back in time and and say hello to the little yeah. person. And I love the concert part that I read, because back then, I went to Sean's two concerts in Chicago in 78, mm-hmm. and my mom was going to take me, no problem at all. But then it was the end of March, and a snowstorm hit in Chicago. A major snowstorm, which we never have at the end of March. We hardly ever have that happen. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to be able to go see him. So I'm reading about Millie and she didn't get the tickets. Okay. That wasn't one problem. And then she gets to go and then something else happens. So I'm like, that kind of brought me back to the day because I didn't think I was going to go. I'm like, I have Mm -hmm. two, two shows to go to. And there's a snowstorm. My mom will never say yes. So I was already in my head thinking- I'm not going to be able to go. I was so upset. And then my life, my life is, is over. over. I'm not going to school anymore. I'm going to mm-hmm. hide in my room. Right. And I'm done <laughs> and all this. And then my mom talks to one of her friends who said, I don't mind driving in a snowstorm. I'll take you guys. And I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. Like her friend, I barely even knew her. She was going to take me to my special show that I need oh to be God. at. I need to be there. That neighbor. Oh my, you need to write that person a letter right now. Oh, yes, yes. We're going to dig. Um, We're going to find it. We're going to find I that just, person. you know, certain people in your life that are special, she was special. Yes. Because she, she drove me and my mom day. and my friend, dropped us off in Chicago, which I'm sure was close to by where Doris wow. was. But I know Doris was unfortunately mm-hmm. able to go to those concerts. Yes. So those are the concerts in the uh, 70s that happened. Right after my grandma passed away, and I didn't want to ask my mom. But Denise didn't get to go. It worked out okay. Mm-hmm. Don't feel bad. I missed the amphitheater. But I had friends in school that had my back, and they brought me a shirt and told me all about oh. it. For it now. And that is meaningful, isn't it, right? When when those friends bring you something from, from the concert, that is meaningful. Because it's like what you said, Dame. You, this shirt was in the room where he was. <laughs> yeah, that's you. Like it has his being on it, his humanity on it. The air that he breathed is on this shirt. Well, mm-hmm. I have a question about yes. the book. But going back to the the, okay. the characters' uh, names, yeah. uh, Millie and Billy. Every time I read it, I think Millie Vanilli, and I'm like, <laughs> I know, and I know Millie yeah, is Millicent, and I forget. I think um, I forget Billy's <laughs> name. So sounds like an English name to me. Yeah. It's Wilhelm. His name is Wilhelm, but then his parents started calling him Billy, and Millie is like, you did not. Don't do that to me. We can't <laughs> yeah. be Millie Oh, Billy. no, she's funny. Come on. She thinks like a teenager. She's funny. But you do name <laughs> drop. You name drop in the book, though. There's more names in there. Oh, yes. Okay, so this is... This is a little secret, and this is especially for people our age, because I wanted this book to sort of be a tribute to the first crush experience, the first celebrity crush experience for people of all ages. And so I hid the names of Mm -hmm. first crushes Mm -hmm. throughout history in the characters of the book. But I I hide them. I... um, I change the yes. spelling. I might put a f- last I name first. There might be a name that rhymes. And so if you go to my website, which is kristennilsonbooks.com, 
you can see there's basically a key to all of these crushes that are hiding in the book and a little biography of oh. each one of them. It's not really, I, it's not a journalistic biography. It is my personal take oh. on each and every one of those people. So, you know, you'll have somebody, I'll be like, yeah, I didn't like no, it. Was, uh, was Millie Vanilli <laughs> one or was that just me in my crazy hair, girl? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Millie Vanilli, we f- see, I was too old to be, how do I explain this? When I was in college, you would think people were attractive. So I definitely thought Millie Vanilli was incredibly attractive. But now I'm dating real boys, yeah. real men. So yeah, I don't have so. crushes the same way. I only objectify them, which sounds really terrible, but I'm only identifying people as cute or not cute. <laughs> um, and Millie Vanilli was, I think they were hot, right? And everybody yeah, thought were. they were hot. It- but I don't know that they were served up as teen idols. Like, no, they, they weren't. weren't. Stuff like that. They weren't. I don't think so. So mm-hmm. that was just in my head. Every time I read Millie and Millie Billy. Millie and Billy. I'm like. <laughs> when, when did you first want to write a book? How old were you when you first? Okay, this is interesting because everyone, um, a very, very common question mm-hmm. that I'll get is, was this a lifelong yes. dream of yours to write this book? No, it Hmm. wasn't. But it is a very full circle moment. Mm -hmm. So I am a librarian by trade, a children's librarian by trade. I'm a children's librarian and a children's bookseller by trade because I was a big reader when I was a child and I held on to those Mm -hmm. books. I continue to love those books and I wanted to tell other people about those books. When you're a person who is into children's literature, everybody says to you, oh, are you going to write a book? And I was very indignant. No, of course I'm not going to write a book. Reading is not the same as writing. Those are two very different things. But the truth is, I was the writer. No matter where I, no matter what kind of job I had, that was your I was the person they came to. It, 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 I wouldn't even okay. have called it my passion at that point. I think I would have called it um, the thing that I'm good at. Okay. Because people would come to me for, I have to write this really important email. I have to write a press release. I have to write a flyer. Kristen was the one you went to, right? So then when Liam was born, when my son was born, and I was a stay-at-home parent, and I was kind of going out of my mind in a lot of ways, and I now know in retrospect it's because I was not working. And I was having, I was really struggling with that. I didn't have a, you know, as you said, it was a passion. I didn't have a thing that just belonged to me. I felt like a child care worker, which is a horrible thing to say about your own child. You love your child deeply, but child care is a different thing altogether. And I had a therapist who said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to carry a notebook around with you. And I want you to just, whenever you're having feelings, just write them down. Write, 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 write. And these turned into little mini essays. And I started really expressing myself and ranting and making observations and putting two and two together. And I would go back in my history and I would say, oh, when I was a kid, I liked this. And that's similar to what this is. And let's examine that feeling. And then I started a blog Mm -hmm. and that blog started to get some attention and people started asking me to write for their like online magazines and things like that. And I was always writing essays, like personal essays very personal about parenting or my child or the world. And then I have a friend who is a young adult author and she, and she wanted to get together with me to ask me a very important question. I'm like, Oh, this sounds very serious, very ominous. What is this? And she said, I want you to write a novel. And I immediately said, but I don't write fiction. And she said, do it anyway. (laughs) And I Said okay. It sounded like an, <laughs> like like an autobiography to me, though. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did it. That's what I wanted it to. That's what it really ended up yeah. being. Yeah, right. It's there's so much of me on you the page, and that's mm-hmm. how I, that's how I learned how to do fiction. Mm-hmm. And so, because basically my friend ordered me to do this, it's like she unlocked something in me that I didn't know I Thank had. Thank you to your friend. <laughs> and yes, oh, her name is Annie. Annie, Annie will that's forever awesome. be indebted to you. And Annie is actually in the dedication. The dedic- the book is dedicated to Sean Cassidy, Andy Gibb, all of the Bee Gees, Justin Bieber, Justin okay. Tiro, is all of the people that I love. Yeah. And to my friend Annie, who said, Isn't that a Willie anyway. Nelson song to because all the people I've loved before? Pretty Annie much, Hill. yeah. Yeah. And it's it's a book also to all the boys yeah. I've loved before. <laughs> so it it's something that was there the whole time that I didn't know was there the whole time. She recognized it and she pushed me to unleash and that's why you, for your title. And we're all happy. Yeah, worldwide crush. Mm-hmm. Now you have to tell us about your trip ah, to thanks. New York. 
we're dying to find out what happened with New York. Okay, so no. this is very, this is really, really important. So I have this book called Worldwide Crush that is inspired by my first crush on Sean Cassidy. Sean Cassidy just happens to be having a concert in New York mm-hmm. City. And I'm like, I need See? him to know about this mm-hmm. book. I need him. I just need him to be aware yes. of the fact that he's played a role in the creation right. of something that kids are going to read forevermore. And so we he was aware of he was aware of it. He knew about it. He's still not responding to me that much. Um, you know, because I would send him emails, I would send him DMs. And so I knew that he knew who I was and what this book was. We go to the concert and we're and we get a text. When I say we, I'm talking about my podcast co-hosts, mm-hmm. Carolyn and Michelle and me. We're sitting at the table. We're getting ready for the Sean Cassidy concert. We're, you know, bated breath. We can't wait for him to come to the stage. And we get a text saying, would you like to come upstairs and meet Sean Cassidy? Wow. And we instantly turn into the Three Stooges. Yeah. I mean, we're but just did like, you, ah, yeah. we're bumping into each other. Did you go. get the text from somebody yeah, you knew yeah. or was this like a prank kind of thing? It was a PR person. That wow. he must have, you know, he passed things on Like, did you know to. this person? Like, you thought, well, I don't know this person. How do you know it's real? We knew we had seen her name on things, so right. we were aware okay. of Good. her. Yes. Um, I really think it was Tracy. Sandler. Yeah, I think so, too. Yes, it was. We all know it Tracy. Was Tracy. It was Tracy. Mm-hmm. Not, not the wife, yeah. Tracy. It was Tracy. His tour manager, That's Tracy. Right. Yeah, we, we met her. Oh, the tour manager. Yes. That's who it was. Yeah. It was we the know tour her. manager. Yes. So we, um, the three stooges get taken upstairs in this cranky old elevator and, um, you know, it's like a million years old and you don't even know if you're going to make it to the top and you get out and, and we walk the, the doors of the elevator open and we walk out and there's Sean Cassidy standing at a piano doing vocal exercises. And you, it's, a it's a moment because after all of this work, after all of the delving that I've done into my soul to create this story and these characters inspired by him. There he was. And you froze. Is. There he is. Well, you know what's really interesting? I vowed to myself that if this happened in this moment in with my book in hand, that I would just take a breath and be in the moment. Okay. Yes. I just kept telling myself, slow okay. down. Do not fall over yourself. Don't, Don't cry. Just, just be in the moment. <laughs> Don't cry. Be in the moment and appreciate every Savor moment. It. So I think I was a little dopey faced. Um, I did not cry, I but I was dopey faced, like just staring at him a little bit because I was trying yeah, to drink it in. I'm like, this is this the is moment. Him. Drink yes. it in. And so I have my book and I ask him to sign my book for me and he very graciously does. And he, he opens the book and he takes the pen and I say, it's, it's Kristen. Mm -hmm. And I start to spell my name and he drops the pen and he looks at me and he goes, I know. (laughs) He pays attention to things like that. He does. Yes. That's right. He pays attention. And so that was the moment when I realized he's completely aware Mm -hmm. of my presence and he's completely aware of Mm -hmm. this book. He got his own copy of the book, and I am just happy. I just needed him to yes. have it. I there signed his go. book. Yes. And it's, you know, who knows what happens to the book, whether it's in its house or whether it went in the garbage. Oh. I have no idea. I just needed to have that mm-hmm. moment yes. to honor yes. what he did mm-hmm. for me and the quote-unquote relationship dream. that we had in 1977. Mm-hmm. It really was a dream. And then this is the part that I've never said publicly before, but I'm going to tell you guys because I think you'll appreciate it. Um, Oh, my God. My husband is going to (laughs) die when I tell you this story. So we have this beautiful moment where I did succeed because I had written Millie's experience where she gets overwhelmed and she loses it and she's Mm -hmm. paralyzed. So I had this big knowledge, like, don't miss out on this experience. And so I fully embraced the moment. And I... We had pictures taken and I remember like standing there with my, I put my arm around him and I'm, and I'm, we're looking at the camera and I remember thinking in this moment, like, this is a man, this is a father, this is a husband, this is, this is a man who goes to soccer practice with his kids. Mm -hmm. I just, I felt his whole humanity in that moment and that was part of me drinking in the moment, right? So I felt so successful in the way that I managed all of that. (laughs) Yeah, it really did. It really did. And so we say goodbye. We say break a leg. We go back down in the elevator and we find our seats in the audience and wait for him to begin. And I turn my phone over and there's a text and it says, do you want to come up and have some sex? What? And for three quarters of a second, I thought Sean Cassidy (laughs) wanted to have sex with me. 
And you guys, my reaction, this is not what everybody is assuming. My reaction was, no, 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 that's, that's not what, that's not what this is. That's, I, you've misinterpreted, (laughs) you've misinterpreted what I feel. I realized, again, I don't know how, it felt like three hours that I had that panic. It may have been less than one second. I realized that my when I turned my phone over, it had opened an old text thread. Oh, it's your husband. From my husband. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're like, wait, what is this? I'm a, I'm a happily yeah. married woman. Yeah. But that's <laughs> oh your husband. Oh, my God. And I, and I don't want him to be that person either. That was part right. of it is that when I'm learning who what it's like to be in love for the first time, I am not going for the bad boy. I am going for the, like you said, Cindy, the boy mm-hmm. next door. The boy next door does not proposition <laughs> married women. Yeah. yeah. So you right? When his wife is at home taking care of the yeah. children. Yes, yes. Exactly. That's not the person that I fell in love with. So I was like, no. Yeah. You ruined it. Yeah. <laughs> I just want your signature. Yeah. Not, yeah. not your child. <laughs> not your child. Just your signature. Just your signature. Right. Picture. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, so then when I finally figured it all out and I got all my feelings sorted out, I loved him. Yeah. <laughs> so that's funny. I, I have a, a quick question. Minus the part about the little escapade, yes. <laughs> um, the tryst, didn't you write this whole encounter somewhere? I read everything you just said about getting the text, getting on the elevator, showing at the piano. Mm-hmm. I've read it and I was telling Cindy I read it. That's why I knew. What you were about to say? Oh, and, oh God! Uh, yeah, it must have been somewhere. You, it was on your. So phone, that's you know? a good question. We certainly had. Um, we had a po- podcast episode mm-hmm. in which we did a reflection on the entire experience. So that's possible. Did I read it or did I write it in an Instagram post? That's mm-hmm, also yeah. a possibility. You wrote it somewhere because I didn't yeah. hear it. I read it and I remember. I think reading- okay. So then it is. Definitely an Instagram post. Okay. And if people want to see that, I'm at Kristen.Nilson.Writer. And if you scroll through, it's a picture of me, grown up me, with my arm around a very human I remember having my arm around him too like that. And I just felt like, I'm like, yeah, this is really him. Yes. It's very, and it, and it is validating that you had really good taste when you <laughs> yes. were a kid. Right? Yeah. Like, this is a yes, good and person. He didn't go off in a weird This is who we no. all aim Yeah, no. he didn't go in a weird direction. No, he, he didn't, didn't drink and do drugs. Mm-mm. This man stayed the yeah. course and was a family man and, and did his job. And he just wanted to come back and say yeah. hi. You guys went there with absolutely no intent of meeting Sean. No. He hadn't discussed right. it with you. There was yeah. no email. There was no, no, we were. We, I certainly tried, okay. right? We certainly tried. We let him know that we would be there. I let him know that I would really like him. I would like to give him a copy of my book. And so there, um, so there was a little bit of back and forth there. And but you um, had a podcast so with we him. Had he was on your podcast? Um, that was oh, before. Shoot, was that after? Oh, that okay. was before. Yeah, you're right. That's right. He was on That's your podcast. Right. It was before. So we had actually yeah. spoken with him. So it was as if we had established a relationship right. of some kind, right. right? So we had been vetted, really, that we weren't going to, you know, climb yeah, all over him. To, we were going to climb him like a that. tree. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, but there, there's still that little girl in you who doesn't want to make assumptions, right. right? So we've spoken with him. He knows about my book. But we can't walk into the concert making an assumption that sure. we're in, right? right? Because we're That's still little girls, saying. and um, and we have to be happy with that. We have to be happy with what we've got. And he might be right. too busy. Maybe he doesn't want to talk to us. That's every he has every right to not want to, you know, talk with these girls who were in love with him when he was twelve. Um, mm-hmm. And so when it did happen, it was it was very validating for so many reasons. And one of them being that it was sort of like, he's like, you guys are OK. Yes. yes. You guys are okay. yes. And that's mm-hmm. what I got out of it. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. You knew you had your podcast episode. You knew he knew who you are. That's all been yeah. established. And you didn't go there expecting anything. And Absolutely just for not. that to come right. to you, that's right. the most that, that's. I was like, wow. But I think for us, you yeah. know, knowing that he was on your podcast, we're like, well, heck yeah, he's going to go talk to him and meet him and stuff. But we didn't know that that wasn't even planned. Mm-hmm. This just happened when you got there. That's right. 
That's right. It was not planned. It's all very up in the air because, of course, it's it's dependent on how he's sure. feeling. Yes. Right. Correct. Yes. And we thought if it did happen, we certainly didn't think it would be before the concert. He's getting ready yeah, to go on stage. Right. Um, we thought maybe he would invite people up after the concert. And so that's what we were hoping for. Right. But we hadn't gotten any kind of confirmation like that. So we're like, you know what? We're here to enjoy the show. We're just here to enjoy the show and everything, anything else it's is still gravy. worth it. And yeah. to mention too, we did yeah. mm-hmm. attend the concert with you guys in Chicago. That's right. That was the first concert that we, um, the f- first official concert on his tour that mm-hmm. we went oh, to really? as a podcast. Oh, yeah, you're passing um, out stuff. Yes, because prior to that, um, I had gone to that little show at a winery in Santa Barbara yes. prior to the pandemic when he was just like, you know what, do people care? Do people want to hear this? And I saw that Facebook post in Minnesota and I was like, I'm going to get on a plane. <laughs> yes. I got to go to California. It's no question. I got to go. No question. Yes. And so at that time, there was no tour. Right. There was no, he had not performed at all in in over yeah. 40 years. Um, and so it was really an experiment to see if people care. Oh. I'm so, I feel so lucky that I acted on that very mm-hmm. impulsive decision to fly to this winery in Santa Barbara because I saw him in a room with like 50 to 100 yeah. people. It was a small. I mean, it was just teeny weeny. It was yeah. very he likes small. likes a small venue. It and- was. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. great. It, yeah, he really thrives mm-hmm. in that atmosphere. And it was so personal. And there were family members there. And um, man, the love in that room. It was really, really great. And you got the feeling that he was so surprised <laughs> that oh, we showed up. <laughs> yeah, we showed up. It meant a lot to him, even uh-huh. though it's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of us meeting you at the podcast, let's talk about the Pop Culture Preservation Society yeah. podcast. Your podcast. Man, we thought you guys were rock stars. We come oh, outside, you. we met Krista, Michelle, and Carolyn mm-hmm. um, at the City Winery Chicago. And it was right after the Sean Cassidy show. And Cindy mm-hmm. and I, and we all walk outside and we're walking down the street and we're like, Hey, and we go over and, <laughs> and we're thinking, oh my gosh, these girls, these women have this great thing. And we were so enamored by, is that the word? That is so nice and, of you. We loved meeting you that night. It was re- That was a great time to, um, again, be in the same room with people who had the mm-hmm. same feelings that you had at the same time that you had them when yes. you were a child. And we had just started this podcast, like Dory said, the Pop Culture mm-hmm. Preservation Society, which is really about um, celebrating and elevating all of these little Gen X pop culture moments. If you were born between the years of 1965 and 1980, we all kind of watched the same Mm -hmm. shows. We listened to the same music. We went to the same movies. We played the same games. And we just sort of realized that those things were getting kind of shoved off to the side Mm -hmm. a little bit in favor of you know, some other generations were a little noisier than technology and, all and my this. son didn't even know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Technology and everything. My son didn't even know what Brady Bunch was. And I, that scared <laughs> the bejesus out of me that he didn't know who Marsha Brady was. Wow. And so we start this podcast for that purpose. But Sean Cassidy is a part of that origin story because when I went to that winery to see Sean Cassidy, Carolyn, one of my co-hosts was like, I need to go with you. I'm getting on a plane with you. I know this is crazy, but we have to do this together. And so we shared that experience together. And our other co-host, Michelle, had just joined the writing group that Carolyn and I were in. And she didn't really know us yet, but she's watching us from afar. And she has FOMO like crazy. And she's like, how how do I get to go with them too? And so she's really just, she's texting us the whole time because she wants so badly to be a part of it. When we get home, um, Michelle gets a job to write an article for um, ARP magazine about fangirling after 50. Oh. And she immediately thinks of Carolyn and I getting on that airplane to go see Sean Cassidy. Yeah. And we have a conversation. She interviews us for this article. And we have this conversation that was like two and a half hours long. And at the end of it, Carolyn says, this should be a podcast. Ah. And here we are, 160 episodes wow. later, having talked about Everything from Sean Cassidy to Land of the Lost to um, Battle of the Network mm-hmm. Stars and Kramer versus Kramer Everything. and after school specials. And we are having the time of our lives. We taught ourselves just like you mm-hmm. guys did. We taught ourselves how to do a podcast. We didn't know. Right. What a, podcast a lot of learning. Was. A lot of learning involved. Yeah. A mm-hmm. lot of learning. 
And we are women in midlife. And it was just sort of the ultimate expression of it really gets better as you get older. Do not be afraid of turning 50 because 50 is when you start doing exactly what you want to do. You have more bandwidth. You have more time. You have, you're have you're probably solid in your job. You're not climbing the ladder in the same way that you were previously. Yes. And you can start looking in your heart a little mm-hmm. bit more and doing some really interesting And sometimes and maybe your kids things. are gone and they're doing their own thing. Yeah. And that's right. You get a hobby well, and this is it. <laughs> Kristen, I read somewhere that you said that you started this uh, during the pandemic and we were pretty miserable during that time. Right. But it was because you wanted to make other people feel better. The timing was so impeccable because we were everyone was struggling during the pandemic and we we started meeting in the pandemic yeah. and then things shut down tremendously and we were like, "Uh-oh, is yeah. this over before we've begun?" We decided to keep going. That's how we learned how to record remotely and it turned out to be exactly what people yes. needed in that moment in time because what people didn't realize there was sort of like a dirty little secret in their houses is that a full 50% of people in the pandemic admitted to consuming the pop culture of their childhood during the pandemic in order to sort of soothe their Mm -hmm. hearts. They were so anxious Mm -hmm. about so much that they start watching the Brady Bunch every night. I bought a record player so that I could play my records. I I did it. I became that person. I, yeah. I turned on all the old rerun channels and started yep. watching any and everything from the 70s. And yes. Yes, I, I was. Because we wanted person. to forget about what was going on outside our door. We wanted to just sort of cocoon ourselves in something that was light and fluffy um, and reminded us of a time when we didn't have any worries. It's not that it was necessarily. Yeah, Sean was prevalent it, it on his page a, at that point, too. That's right. He was more becoming active. more active yes. because he, too, was in right. his house. And here we are, yes. right? So it's it's the the podcast has become our full time job. Somehow I managed to be a full time podcaster and a full time mm-hmm. writer, and oh, wow. I don't know how I'm doing any of that. <laughs> but when you love something, you just make it yeah, happen, exactly. right? We yeah. really appreciate the support that Kristen, Carolyn, and Michelle give us because oh, you uh, are so welcome. We, We're so proud of you. We took this thing. And I have to give credit where credit is due. Penny was like the, one of the first people yes. to even bring it up. Mm-hmm. Instead of a it. Facebook page, it, we wanted to do a podcast. And actually, girls love to talk, right? So girls love stories. That's right. And we want to bring it out as a story and go through everything yeah. in history. And some of us know, you know, a lot, but some of some things we don't. Well, so we're learning all, as we're going. But here we are and we're doing yeah. it because if you set your mind to something, you can do it. You can. Oh, Ladies you. have made women over 50 with podcasting a real thing. And yeah, you, let's and, do it, right? You, There's so much out there and it's not ever been approached in this way mm-hmm. before. So I think it's really important. And it's interesting because we can now look at it with a little bit of through the lens of history. We have more information that we can apply to it. If you had done this 10 years ago, you might not have the same perspective. I listen to uh, as many as your podcasts as I can. Mm -hmm. I just listened to your Kramer versus Kramer podcast. And that one touched me. And I think it may be because I have come from a divorce family. Me too. Me too. Whatever. Mm -hmm. But I was like, wow. I, I didn't realize so many people saw that movie in a the theater. That Isn't that interesting? So children, many. so many children. That episode, I'm really, really proud of it. And I knew that it would make a splash because it's unusually yeah. serious for us. We have a lot of fun on this podcast, but we don't shy away from the serious mm-hmm. topics. And Kramer versus Kramer really sort of illuminated how many of us Gen mm-hmm. Xers were affected by divorce mm-hmm. at a time when nobody knew how to True. do it. Our parents didn't know what to do. They didn't know that there was a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And we were just the canaries in the coal mine. Yeah. My parents divorced when I was 10. So Mm -hmm. when this movie came out, I was like, wow, they're really talking about this. Like, this is a thing. Yeah. So many 10-year-olds. I cannot tell you how many people's parents divorced when they were 10. Yeah. What is that? That's when we started going to church and my parents had to get married. (laughs) Oh! (laughs) 
the hippies yes, had yes, to get married. Yes, yes, they were like, okay, mm-hmm. uh, we can't do this anymore. It's so then my dad ended up on the couch, and he's like, uh-uh, this isn't happening. We're getting married. <laughs> yeah. So ten year, yes, yourself. I was 10 years old when you they see? first started going to church. Yes. And, it's not and about my, that age of 10. Yeah, and my dad was kicked mm-hmm. out to the couch. Dory. That's funny. Your dad gets kicked out to he's the He's like, couch. no, we're getting married. <laughs> oh, my God. Turns on yeah. a dime, So right? it was the opposite mine. <laughs> yeah. But it's really an interesting phenomenon. I'm not sure that Gen Xers ever acknowledged the role that they played in divorce culture. Mm-hmm. Should I call it divorce culture? But really, it, 50% of us. True. That's right. True. Mm-hmm. In the summer of 2025 oh. will be the sequel to Worldwide Crush. Have you put Worldwide Crush on audio yet? I know you were reading the book. You said That's you couldn't right. have so, anyone else be Millie's voice but you. It is in production right now. I read, I did the audio for it. I did not want to have them hire an actor. I felt very strongly about that. It was going to be me reading it. And the experience of reading it was really quite profound because there are moments where I start to cry. And so I had to do a couple of test runs and I would send it to people and say, have you ever heard an audiobook where the reader is crying? <laughs> is that okay? And so far, everybody has said, you know, it, it adds putting a emotion into it. it makes it feel yeah. very real. Yeah. So it's oh, staying. The crying okay. is staying. Oh. I mean, I'm not blubbering, but I'm, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to get through a sentence and she I'm choking emotion. up and you can hear that I'm yeah. struggling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll tell you a secret. I wrote the ending of Worldwide Crush first. <laughs> See? And then I had to figure out how to get them there. And part two Can't is on wait. Its way. So- thank you for being on here today, oh, Kristen. Thank you. I had a ball, you guys. This is a lot of fun. I was so happy to be here with you. I'm so proud of you guys. You're doing such a good job. And I was just super eager to be here with you. To get your copy of Kristen's book, Worldwide Crush, go to Pop Culture Preservation Society's website and click on Kristen's book. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you from the bottom of our teen dream hearts. Keep on crushing. Always believe in magic. And have a peaceful, fantastic week. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and subscribe to our new YouTube page. Make sure to keep in touch with us at our email, Society at gmail.com. The Sean Squad Society podcast, including past, present, and future versions, and its contents are owned and controlled by the Sean Squad Society. The podcast is written, produced, and recorded at the Borden Studios, and the views and opinions are solely those of the Sean Squad Society podcast. We may think we are always right, but we may get things wrong from time to time, so we assume no responsibility for errors of submission of content.